Oh, hi! You caught me practicing my shape-shifting. Speaking of shape-shifting, let's talk about Marvel Comics' shape-shifting scrolls, and especially how they appeared in the Kree-Scroll War. Hello! Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. The Marvel Cinematic Universe has just debuted Captain Marvel, and a big part of the background of that movie is the ongoing war between two alien races, the militaristic Kree and the shape-shifting Skrulls. Now, both of those races were created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby in the pages of Fantastic Four, but their importance in the comics was elevated by writer Roy Thomas in his run on The Avengers. Specifically, he had a nine issue run that has come to be called the Kree Scroll War, and I think it's basically the predecessor to the event comics that both Marvel and DC publish these days. Today I want to break down that storyline, talk about how it was a precursor to event comics, and specifically dive into writer Roy Thomas's techniques. Let's do it. In June of 1971, issue 89 of The Avengers kicked things off. Roy Thomas had taken over writing The Avengers from Stan Lee in issue 35. He later said in a 2000 trade paperback collection of the Kree Scroll War that he hadn't had it planned out, but had an overall idea to utilize the two alien races and involve the Avengers when the aliens intend to use Earth as a strategic battleground, very similar to what we did with the Pacific Islands during World War II. But where did writer Roy Thomas come from? In June of 1965, he'd accepted a job at DC Comics as an assistant to Mort Weisinger, the editor on the Superman titles. But before he'd even been there two weeks, he took a job as an editorial assistant at Marvel Comics. By the end of that year, he had his first published work released, a story in Modeling with Millie No. 44. His first superhero story was an Iron Man tale in Tales of Suspense No. 73 the following year. That year, he began writing for Sgt. Fury, Uncanny X-Men, and The Avengers. At this point in time, Marvel was ready to hire some new writers, and they'd given tryouts on various issues to veterans like Don Rico and newcomers like Denny O'Neill. None of them lasted. Roy Thomas did. Stan Lee liked something about his writing style. And while Roy Thomas would go on to probably be more famous for his work on Conan with John Buscema, he also created a lot of important things within the context of the Avengers, and that's what we're going to break down right now. The story begins with the Avengers tracking down Captain Marvel. Until recently, he and teenager Rick Jones had their molecules merged, and they could swap back and forth between being in this reality or waiting in stasis in the negative zone. In a flashback, we see that Captain Marvel had witnessed Mr. Fantastic of the Fantastic Four battle Annihilus in the negative zone, and that Mr. Fantastic had created a portal between the realities. Rick trades places with Captain Marvel to break into the Fantastic Four's headquarters and use it to free Rick Jones from the Negative Zone so that they can both exist together. Meanwhile, the Avengers were alerted to the Fantastic Four break-in and go after Captain Marvel because he's gathered a lethal amount of radiation from his time in the Negative Zone. The team also briefly battles Annihilus and, with the help of some scientist allies, withdraw the radiation from Captain Marvel, which knocks him out temporarily. In that first issue, we got to see Roy Thomas use his deep knowledge of Marvel Comics and its continuity. He had written a lot of the original Captain Marvel stories, which followed an alien Kree named Marvel, who became an ally to Earth, rebelling against his people. This issue brings Marvel back after not being in comics for a while, and also uses a Fantastic Four story as a means to bring him back. Meanwhile, Captain Marvel's return comes to the attention of Kree military leader Ronan the Accuser, who stages a coup against the Kree's artificial intelligence leader, the Supreme Intelligence. In the second issue, Ronan activates a massive robot known as the Sentry to abduct Captain Marvel. The Sentry reveals it's part of Ronan's plan Atavis, which is explained later. The team returns to their mansion and are greeted by teammate Goliath. He tells them that the former Avengers and husband and wife team of Wasp and Yellowjacket sent an emergency call from Alaska where they're performing research. The team arrives there and Wasp explains they found a jungle in the middle of the Arctic with a strange technological device in the middle. 
As they approached, Yellow Jacket sensed the danger and tossed Wasp away, but he fell inside the strange area. Goliath is the first to enter, but is knocked out by Ronin and Sentry, and brainwashed to battle the Avengers. As that happens, Ronan explains to an imprisoned Captain Marvel that his plan Atavis is to bombard Earth with a ray that will de-evolve humanity so that the Kree can easily take over the planet and use it as a military staging ground. The issue ends with Yellow Jacket as a caveman attacking Wasp. This issue utilizes several of writer Roy Thomas's tropes. For instance, he was very well known for, even in a continuing story, being able to tell one complete story within each issue and then ending on a dramatic cliffhanger. He also had a habit for using goofy dialogue that's very reminiscent of Stan Lee's. This is because he was Stan Lee's protege. They were very close, and in fact, the last known photograph of Stan Lee is of Roy Thomas visiting him. Roy Thomas has Goliath joking around about being a 10-foot Toreador, and Rick Jones calls him High Pockets. There's also an appearance by Carol Danvers, who was co-created by Roy and artist Jean Colan. At this time, she was an Air Force officer and an ally of Marvel, but years later, other writers would turn her into Ms. Marvel, and later, Captain Marvel. There's also an explanation of Sentry's history, where Roy references past issues of both Thor and Fantastic Four. He was a big fan of tying things together. In issue 91, the Avengers continue to battle Sentry and Goliath. Quicksilver knocks out Goliath by jumping and tucking himself into a ball, which seems like a questionable strategy, but it works. The Sentry knocks out Vision and Scarlet Witch, and the three unconscious Avengers are taken to Ronin's building in the center of the jungle. There, we see for the first time the burgeoning love story of Vision and Scarlet Witch, which ultimately defines a lot of their history. Rick Jones and Quicksilver break in before Ronan can de-evolve the Avengers back to Amoeba, and Quicksilver keeps doing that jumping ball attack. It serves enough of a distraction for Rick to free the Avengers. Before Ronan can fight back, he receives a call from the Kree galaxy that they are now at war with the Skrulls, and Ronan returns to his people. Sentry has no guidance, so he self-destructs, but the Avengers escape in time and Yellow Jacket reverts to a human from a caveman. This issue is the first time to explicitly refer to the Skrulls and the Kree being at war. It also features a lot of Roy Thomas's original creations. Actually, what he tended to do was take existing characters and modify them. For instance, Goliath used to go by the identity of Hawkeye. He's Clint Barton. And at this point in time, uh, the original giant man, uh, Hank Pym, had left the Avengers and given his powers to Clint. Uh, simultaneously, uh, Hank Pym had taken on the new identity of Yellow Jacket instead of Ant-Man or Giant Man. So that was something that Roy Thomas specifically liked to do, and I think it's one of the cool things about ongoing serialized superhero comics that a later writer can take a character and change them into something new. A great example would be the fact that later writers turned Carol Danvers into Ms. Marvel and eventually Captain Marvel. The Avengers are relaxing at their mansion when they hear the latest news. Senator H. Warren Craddock has formed a subcommittee to find aliens hiding among us after the news of the Avengers' last adventure. Carol Danvers visits the Avengers and offers to help Captain Marvel hide out at an abandoned farm while they figure out the best next steps. Nick Fury and S.H.I.E.L.D. arrive to take Captain Marvel in for the government, but Karen and Marvell leave in the much faster Avengers Quinjet. Protesters form outside the mansion, and the Avengers head to the Capitol to testify. In an interesting bit, Senator Craddock refuses to accept the testimony of Vision because he's an artificial being. The Avengers fail to convince the Senate that not all aliens are a threat and head back to their mansion. There, the original founding members, Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man, declare that they're doing a terrible job and disband the Avengers. There are several ideas in this issue that I wish had more time to breathe. For instance, the Senate debating whether the Vision should be allowed to testify because he may not be a sentient being, that's a really interesting idea to explore and it doesn't really get too much time to breathe. Another interesting idea is the fact that Nick Fury definitely believes that Captain Marvel is a hero, but he is also obeying his government orders to take him in and that conflict 
conflict would be really awesome to explore in greater detail. Uh, nevertheless, cool ideas, and one great thing that writer Roy Thomas does in this issue is use real-world politics and then sort of disguise them in fiction. For instance, Senator Warren Craddock and his uh, Alien Activities Subcommittee, that's a very thinly disguised take on the real-world Senator McCarthy and his House Un-American Activities Committee that aggressively went after a lot of our citizens for supposed communist ties. The next issue, the artwork jumps forward with Neil Adams joining the title. The Vision returns to Avengers Mansion only to pass out in front of Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man. Soon, Hank Pym returns as Ant-Man to shrink and heal Vision, who he alone knows how to fix since he created Ultron, who in turn created Vision. After he succeeds and leaves, Vision learns that the three founding Avengers claim they never disbanded the team. A flashback shows us that the Vision, Goliath, Scarlet Witch, and Quicksilver had left to the farm where Captain Marvel retreated, only to be attacked by three cows who then shapeshifted into the Fantastic Four and defeated the Avengers, except for the Vision who escaped wounded. We now see that Captain Marvel has been captured by shape-shifting scrolls. They reveal that they were the same scrolls who originally encountered the Fantastic Four and who had been hypnotized into thinking they were cows. Eventually, other scrolls broke that mind control, and these scrolls impersonated the Avengers to disband them. They battle the entire team while Captain Marvel breaks free and steals back some Kree technology called the Omni Wave Projector, which can both communicate across galaxies or be used as different races as a weapon. He destroys it, and his friend Carol Danvers shapeshifts to reveal she was actually the Super Scroll, who promptly knocks out Captain Marvel. The Scrolls escape on their ship with Quicksilver, Scarlet Witch, and Captain Marvel as their prisoners. This issue steps up the artwork in a big way. Nothing against Sal Buscema. His artwork is good, but Neil Adams and John Buscema's are great, and it really helps evolve this story into a more epic story. Uh, simultaneously, writer Roy Thomas is using his techniques of wrapping in his love of past continuity. He's able to seamlessly roll in Stan Lee's story of the original scrolls from Fantastic Four, as well as his own history with Ultron from the Avengers. Issue 94 begins with Captain America and his team subduing three of the scrolls and contacting the Fantastic Four for more information. Meanwhile, we see that the Vision flew after Super Scroll and silently entered his spaceship. The scroll reveals he has plans to bomb and destroy the home of the Inhumans, humans that were experimented on by the Kree millennia ago, but their city is protected from his blasts. Vision knows he can't defeat Super Scroll alone, so he retreats and Super Scroll returns to his homeworld with Captain Marvel, Quicksilver, and the Scarlet Witch. However, he is attacked by his people because he's in exile. Scroll Emperor Doric takes control of the Avengers prisoners and threatens the mutant siblings unless Marvel agrees to build a new Omniwave projector, to which he reluctantly agrees. The issue ends back on Earth, where Senator Craddock has released a squad of mandroids to imprison the Avengers for not cooperating with his investigation. At the same time, the inhuman Triton approaches the Avengers for help. Iron Man is able to quickly defeat the Mandroids because, as Tony Stark, he designed them. At this point, it was still a secret that Tony Stark was Iron Man. Triton explains he came looking for the Fantastic Four, but with them unavailable, asks for the Avengers' assistance. Maximus has temporarily dethroned Black Bolt, but the Avengers are able to quickly return things to the status quo and declare that they are headed to outer space to rescue their teammates. This is what I mean when I say that this story feels like an event comic. We've got appearances by the Fantastic Four and the Inhumans along with the Avengers. We've got life and death stakes for the entire universe. Everything about this feels big and epic. Uh, at the same time, it's all taking place within one title. That's definitely not the way an event comic would go now where everything would cross over. Now, we've had guest appearances by other characters, no question. We've had big stories uh, in comics, but it wouldn't be another decade plus 
until Marvel released Contest of Champions, its first sort of crossover event miniseries, and it would be a few years more before DC Comics followed up with Crisis on Infinite Earths. So at this point, uh, this was what counted as an event comic, in my opinion. I think it paved the way for how big things could be and how many guest characters you could draw in to the same story. The Avengers borrow a spaceship from S.H.I.E.L.D. and head to the Andromeda Galaxy into the heart of the Skrull Empire. They battle an entire fleet of spaceships and head towards their comrades. Emperor Dorek threatens to kill his prisoners, but Captain Marvel reveals he has built the Omniwave projector and used it to create an illusion of himself, and he begins fighting his captors. Simultaneously, the Skrulls send a massive nuclear missile to destroy all of Earth. And on the Kree homeworld, Ronan has captured Rick Jones and tosses him into a prison with the Supreme Intelligence. It turns out the Supreme Intelligence has a plan, and he uses his vast mental abilities to send Rick Jones back into the Negative Zone. The final issue features Rick tumbling through the Negative Zone. He's attacked by Annihilus, but is able to fight back with a blast of mental energy. We see Quicksilver using his hurtling ball attack to defend Marvell, while he uses the Omniwave projector to try to contact Rick. Then, he seems to wake up and decides to destroy the machine. The Supreme Intelligence transports Rick back to their cell. Before he can explain his plan, Ronan and his guards attack Rick, but Rick has new abilities and summons projections of the Marvel superheroes from the Golden Age. They hold back the Kree military long enough for the Supreme Intelligence to explain that he set all of these events in motion. Rick continues to exhibit vast powers. He freezes the Skrulls in their tracks so the Avengers can defeat their ship carrying the nuclear missile easily. And back on Earth, Senator Craddock is forced to revert into his true Skrull form, where he's killed by an angry mob he'd instigated against aliens. The Supreme Intelligence explains that the Kree and the Skrulls have been at war for millennia, but they've both hit an evolutionary end, and they will never change. So he unlocked something called the Destiny Force within Rick Jones, which someday, far in the future, all humans will have. His reasons for this are not clear, but it's possibly to aim them both at humanity instead of each other. The Supreme Intelligence is back in control of Kree, and he uses his powers to send Rick and the Avengers home to Earth, where Rick re-merges with Captain Marvel. His mind was overwhelmed with his temporary powers, and rejoining with Marvel controls it. This final issue showcases one last trope of Roy Thomas's that I wanted to discuss, and that was his love of the golden age of comic books. Uh, this was something he loved and cared about, and it was his way of taking Marvel's somewhat forgotten golden age characters and finding a way to place them into modern continuity, to have a new generation of readers discover these characters. And he later went on to do something similar at DC Comics, where he used DC's Earth 2 so that he could have crossover events with the Justice Society of America and the Justice League of America. Overall, the biggest changes to emerge from the Kree Scroll War were the romance between Vision and Scarlet Witch and the ongoing war between the Kree and the Scroll. Another huge plus was the artwork, which is very good to great throughout. In terms of a downside, it is a little strange that the Avengers aren't really active participants in their own story. They really only get directly involved in the last third of the story, and up until then, a lot of the events that are set in motion are driven by either Captain Marvel or Rick Jones. Kind of weird since this is an Avengers title. Uh, that said, it's an overall very fun and exciting story, and the background of the Kree Scroll War would go on to have ramifications up until more recent times. Uh, it's still playing a role in the comics, like in the Annihilation storyline. Uh, it's being used as background for the Captain Marvel movie. So there was a lot of important stuff set up there, and I definitely recommend giving it a read. And if you like writer Roy Thomas's style, I really strongly recommend checking out his work with John Buscema on Conan. All right, that said, let's take a look at what fan art came in for the channel this week. First up, Mateo Gulen from Ecuador returns with a cute drawing of me appreciating Black Condor, and you can see Mateo's Instagram listed below. Machik Smaga creates this somewhat disturbing artwork based off of my recent Brat Pack review. 
Nicely done. Tyler Garcia made a cool Comic Tropes logo in the 8-bit video game style. I'd like to note that I love logo art. Lucas Medret from Poland has created a pinup reminiscent of Mobius's artwork with Alejandro Jodorowsky. His website is listed below if you want to see more. J. Andrew World illustrated me as an Equisapiens from my Black Condor episode. You can see J. Andrew World's Twitter and his YouTube listed below. Jacob Virgil sends in a portrait of me in his style, which I really like. That is fun. And you can see Jacob's Instagram account there. John Dupree sends in this quick animation. Very creative. I love it. William Sanchez created artwork that envisions me as the Silver Surfer. Very cool. Check out William's DeviantArt page listed right there. Finally, John Ross sends in a beautiful illustration featuring myself with Black Condor's powers and suit. All right, folks, every episode I love to feature the artwork that you send in. If you would like to send in a piece that's directly related to Comic Tropes, just send it to this email, comictropes at gmail.com, and I'll feature it. If you want to include a link or anything, you can tell me about that, and then I will number your names. I've got nine entrants this week. I'm going to drop them in a bag, and then I'm going to draw a winner that gets a Gachapon prize that I picked up in Japan from the Gacha Pony Machine, which was donated to us by Lunar Shine Store. All right, let's see who wins this week. We've got number six. Number six. Let's see who that is. Congratulations to Jacob Virgil. Let's take a quick look at what he won this week. Ah, you can see that the Gacha Pond Machine's starting to run a little low. Uh, let's see. Oh, all right, this is pretty cool. It's some sort of uh, Pokemon Gacha Pond. So, Congratulations, Jacob. I'll get your address and send that your way. Folks, I really want to say thank you for watching. Uh, the channel continues to have fantastic growth, and that's all because of you. If you would like to support this channel, I have a Patreon account where you can support me on a monthly basis. If you can't do that, but you'd still like to do something on a one-time basis, you can leave me a one-time tip through my coffee account. Uh, I plan to do some live streaming this weekend. I love drawing, I love chatting with all of you, so that's something I do from time to time. Uh, just trying to keep at it. Uh, oh, I will say that next week is a patron's choice. So every quarter I will have a poll for uh, patrons at a certain level to vote on. And they voted on something pretty amazing. Um, it is a huge comic. So this has been something I've been planning on for a long time. This, this takes a lot of time and preparation, but that is coming up next time. You should definitely be excited. It's a foreign comic. Maybe you don't know about it. If not, I think it'll be really exciting. If you already know about it, I think it'll be hopefully a little bit more enlightening. Uh, who knows? Who knows? But I really hope you like it. I really appreciate all the support. Until I see you next time, keep reading comics.